we have had a fine presentation in the first half of this meeting about space. And in the second half, we have uh, an excellent beginning with Professor Balram, who has talked about the transformation that Professor Dhawan made at the, to the Indian Institute of Science. As he has already pointed out, uh, the Institute, uh, although it had people like uh, C.V. Raman and others, even in earlier years, on the whole, did not have a very strong research program across the board. And I think that this was particularly true in the engineering departments, because many of them were still really in a situation where the application of science uh, for doing very good engineering had not yet become a possibility. Now, I'm really going to base what I'm going to say largely drawn from my personal experience at the Institute. I um, had an interest in aeronautics. I did a B in mechanical engineering in Bangalore. And on one day when there was, uh, uh, which was observed as an open day at the Institute, in, uh, I think that was about 1951, I went there like uh, many other young people and saw that uh, there was a department of aeronautical engineering just to the left of the gate. And I went there to see what there was. And uh, to my excitement, I found a Spitfire from the Second World War parked under a tree in the quadrangle of the department. Well, that Spitfire had elliptical wings. And suddenly it struck me, well, okay, they don't have to be able to do this. We really need some mathematics. Look at those, look at those beautiful elliptical wings. Why are they elliptical? So this sort of uh, kindled my interest in um, aeronautics. And uh, two years later, at the end of the exam, I had to decide what I was going to do. And my first choice was, uh, of course, going to the Indian Institute of Science and um, learning some aeronautics and see what the subject was like. But actually, unfortunately at that time, aeronautics was not a popular subject. And in fact, uh, the previous year, there were no students in the aero department to work for what at that time was called uh, your diploma. And um, the year before that, there were only two. And all my friends at uh, the Bangalore Engineering College, the Government Engineering College, as it was called, said, why are you going to do aeronautics? You won't get a job after that, uh, after you finish your aeronautics. Well, I uh, found that their favorites were usually um, either the Indian Railway Service or these new petroleum companies that had come up in India, Caltex and uh, Bamashell and so on. They said, either do that or you go abroad. Well, at that time, not many people used to go abroad soon after a BE. That was very rare. And um, I think in the institute, it was um, no different, although it began to change in the coming years after there. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the, what I may call uh, a, the good fortune I had was that the year in which I joined the Institute of Science was also the year in which Professor Dhaban joined the Indian Institute of Science as an assistant professor in the Department of Aeronautical Engineering. He had actually joined the Institute even in uh, 1951, but then he was only a senior scientific officer. But in 1953, he became a faculty member and uh, started a very vigorous effort on research in uh, aeronautics. Before, before this department, and in fact, I would almost say before his advent there, there was really very little research in aeronautics on the, in the Institute, or in, in fact, in the country. What we did have was uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, uh, an industry, 
the child of the Second World War, and um, they were not yet doing much design and so on. The first professor who was at the aeronautical engineering department, Professor B. M. Ghatge, was uh, persuaded by them to go to HAL and set up a design center there. So what was left was actually very little truly scientific research. Now, Dhawan said about this with extraordinary speed. And in fact, um, he started. He started on things which um, the young students would be very interested in. And um, at that time, the exciting thing was supersonic flows. How aircraft can fly faster than the speed of sound? What kind of design would you do there? What is the how, how do what is the what is the aerodynamics at supersonic speeds and so on? And so he built a high-speed aerodynamics laboratory and started making things which he could show to the students. Incidentally, I must say that he was uh, very good in teaching. He went out of his way to explain what things were and uh, to emphasize the fundamentals. And um, as he was doing it, um, he realized, uh, of course, he was actually very good with his hands. He was, uh, uh, well, I'll come to that uh, in a few minutes. He was, um, um, by and large, an experimental uh, engineer. But at the same time, as you've already heard, he had done many other degrees. In fact, he had a total of six degrees, incidentally. He had a course in physics and mathematics. and. Um, he had, he had taken courses in um, you know, mechanical engineering. And then he went to Minnesota, got a master's in uh, aeronautical engineering. Then he went to Caltech. He first got what they used to call an aeronautical engineer's degree, which is uh, roughly like the MSc by research that you do at the Institute of Science. So, what I think, I think a great deal of it, I learned, I, I began to learned later on, was really what he saw what was happening at Caltech. And although I will uh, go back to it a little bit later, the remarkable thing that, uh, or the really surprising thing for a traditional Indian uh, faculty member to find, at Caltech in the aero department there, it was called the uh, Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratories at Caltech, Galsit, CIT, so Galsit. At Galset, it was very hard to see what kind of degrees the faculty had. There were, of course, a few engineers, but there were many others. Uh, there was a mathematician, there was a Paco Lagerstrom, who had a PhD from uh, Princeton, and there were other people. There were people from uh, Britain. Uh, in fact, uh, Professor Liebman, who led the aerodynamics group, was himself actually a physicist. He was not an engineer. And um, in uh, coming years, there were more, more people like that. Professor Jerry Whitton from Manchester, very well known for his wave work, Professor Safman, and so on. So it began to be clear, I'm sure to Dhawan, and it was clear to me when I went there, that the degree in which you had the subject was not the important thing. The important thing was that you should be able to use that knowledge for advances in science or in engineering. And so, based on these principles, I could see that Dhawan had a philosophy about what should be done in the aeronautics department. His philosophy was, what we do should have to do with some engineering problem. After all, we are a department of engineering. But how we do it is to apply science, which is now very difficult to see done anywhere else in the country. And so, he mixed science and engineering, which of course he had done already in his own career, and he had, uh, he had seen it done elsewhere, uh, and going to much greater extents there, to getting people from any field in which they had a PhD, provided they were interested and committed to research of the kind that uh, that particular department would be doing. So, um, the uh, teaching he did, he did introduce here and there 
physics and some mathematics and so on. He was not afraid of mathematics. As uh, I was already uh, told, um, his PhD, PhD in uh, Caltech was actually in aeronautics and mathematics. Now, um, so his, uh, his teaching had this bit of mathematics as well as a very realistic description of the aerodynamics itself and how it would go. I want to show you the extent to which he went with very little money to tell, yeah, sorry, to teach students who still thought, thought, thought of you know, the supersonic flows as uh, something magic, magical, little apparatus which he made. And I think some of these things that he did were really ingenious. And uh, he was, he went out of his way. At that time, there was very little money. And uh, there was, it was not a period when you could get major contracts and so on. He had to scrounge around the money from the department's budget. And the first thing he did was to make a very small supersonic wind tunnel, which I show here at the top. Uh, you know, its diameter is about two inches. You could actually hold it in your hand and go wherever you like. And uh, he bought some old oxygen tanks uh, from uh, aircraft, from the World War II aircraft, and uh, put uh, compressed air in them, and pushed that compressed air through the left of this uh, tunnel which you see. And so you have air coming in from the left, goes through that uh, convergence there, where it becomes sonic, and then it becomes supersonic, and there's a body in front of it, and he set up methods for flow visualization, and you could get pictures like the one shown below, a clear and photograph at a Mach number of 2.3. Well, this is only one example. He had many other examples of this kind, and he wanted to mix at the same time, combine at the same time, experiment, scientific thinking, and mathematics to give you a certain mastery over the subject. Well, I think that uh, uh, I should uh, say that most of the students were very excited by all of this that uh, Dhawan was showing. And um, it was actually a great pleasure. Well, one thing I didn't, uh, I forgot to tell you, was that the first day I saw Professor Dhawan coming into the department to start his course, the first day, is still very vivid in my mind. He was, first of all, a very handsome man and um, uh, a person who was charming, who had uh, uh, very nice ways of uh, talking to people. And um, at that time, the aeronautics department had an old tunnel, which was five feet by seven feet, for uh, t making tests for Hindustan aircraft. And the, uh, destroy, the structure itself of the department was built as a kind of a bridge over that tunnel. So as you entered in, you had stairs up to place the place where the chairman's office was, and then you went down to the lecture hall. And I remember Satish Dhawan coming there on that first day. He had, a, had an MG car, a red sports car, he jumped out of it. Unlike the others at the other faculty at the institute, who really were, you were very formal, uh, wear a coat and uh, tie, dress, uh, suit and dress, so, sorry, suit and tie, almost every day. He just ran up those steps and uh, ran down the steps on the other side, opened the door, got into the uh, lecture room, and said, good morning to you with a big smile on his face. This is something that the students at the Institute were not used to at all. But uh, he immediately became a favorite. And then they could see that he was working very hard. For example, the people at the hostel were all surprised that his office was open even at night. And they would come and tell you, say, he works very hard, you know. And he did work very hard because after his lectures, he passed out material so that they could read it for themselves. Well, um, <laughs> In 1955, yeah, there was one other person whom I liked at that time, that was Professor Tietjens, who was a German student of uh, the celebrated uh, Ludwig Prantl in Göttingen, who really was in a, in a, in a real, really, um, to use the right word, 
the father of modern fluid dynamics. Modern fluid dynamics, fluid dynamics has problems which have still not been solved, even with the best mathematics. The most famous one, of course, is turbulent flows. If the turbulence is to this day an unsolved problem. You can say it's an unsolved problem in fluid mechanics. It's an unsolved problem in mathematics and physics as well. Well, anyway, to come back to it, um, he said uh, uh, he had uh, a five foot by seven foot uh, internal there, the low speed one. He had some high speed ones, small ones. I showed you the kind that I showed you, one inch by three inch and so on. And he had a 20 inch boundary layer tunnel. I helped him. Then he found out that that five foot by seven foot tunnel results are not always uh, reliable. And it turned out that the reason for this is that at that kind of size and the speed that the tunnel had, you would have um, you would have conditions where you, okay, the end, yeah. where towards uh, where, where um, the flow might be neither laminar nor turbulent. Laminar flows are getting to be under control then. But turbulent flows were full of many different kinds of very empirical theories and no understanding. So he said, why don't we do some work on transition? Why don't you work on transition? Now, Professor Tietjens, who was the head of the department, had taken his fluid mechanics class, which is also very good, but very different in character from what Dhawan was doing. And he said, what are you going to do? Uh, this, will, this will give you your diploma uh, this year. And he said, well, I told him, well, I might stay here. I might, uh, I might, uh, well, I was interested in clouds and the atmosphere and so on. I might do some work. I might join the MET people and so on. I gave it two or three alternatives. He said, no, you should go ahead and do research. And if you want to come to Göttingen, if you, if you want to do research, you should go to one only one of two places, either Göttingen or Caltech. And that was not any accident because Caltech had been, uh, the Caltech Aero Department had been set up by Theodore von Kármán, who was actually a graduate of uh, Göttingen. So anyway, to, to, to cut a long story short, at the end of that, of course, at the end of those, uh, I actually started working on it and got some very good uh, results in the sense that uh, the nature of transition had then uh, been under yeah, new proposals. It was no longer a jagged front between laminar and turbulent flow, but there were turbulent spots which uh, propagated down the plate. Well, uh, this was, it was not quite clear. It was, uh, it was proposed, it was a hypothesis, but there was no experimental evidence for it. And one uh, great lab in the United States, the National Bureau of Standards, made some very careful experiments and showed but the old jagged picture is not right. And an hypothesis made by Emmons that it occurred in spots was in fact correct. And he showed uh, the characteristics of these spots and uh, their geometry, the speed, all these things were shown. And so it became clear. They said, yes, the Emmons picture is right. This is the way transition occurs. Well, I also looked at that picture and then I found that you had to measure a thing, measure thing called the intermittency, alternated between laminar and turbulent. And although the spots were there, the intermittency calculation made by Emmons did not apply. This puzzled me for a long time. And there was also Dhawan there with that interest in mathematics. So I looked at his mathematics and found that, uh, yeah, found that in fact, the picture was different. All the spots occurred at one place on that plate. At that point, at that it was shocking. <laughs> it was a total surprise. How could that happen and so on? And uh, I actually thought about it for some months and found that the mathematics that the demons had used, if inverted, would in fact show from the measurements that all the spots were born at one particular spot. And uh, really, um, that led to a major discovery, often done with, uh, uh, thank you.
it's a stop. Often done with um, all kinds of equipment, uh, all kinds of um, very simple equipment. Well, so I really am almost tempted to have to stop here because my time is up. <laughs> but I, I had uh, many other things to say about what Dhawan did in engineering, the number of engineering departments which came up, and the principle that your background does not matter so much. You may be a physicist, you may be a mathematician, but if you are interested in doing these things and help engineering, you come here. And in fact, the department also at that time had two mathematicians. I'm sure that he saw this from what had happened at uh, Caltech. And uh, therefore, over the period that he was there, as I said, he became an associate assistant professor in 52. He became the head of the department in 55. And then at uh, 62, he was director of the Indian Institute of Science. Well, I could go on like this, but let me just summarize. I think that Dhawan actually, of course, um, was not only a supporter of uh, engineering, as uh, Professor Balram has already described to you, he did that across the board. And in fact, he took uh, a great deal of interest in very silently talking about doing social service. There was a little socialist uh, party, so to speak, there, with such people as Professor Vasudev Murthy and uh, Dr. Kosabi from Pune and others. Uh, they were all at heart socialists. But uh, Dhawan never spoke about socialism, but he did socialism. He was a practical socialist. It was the same kind of philosophy that he had in uh, engineering research. Um, this is our job we have to do this, and we do it this way. And uh, he did it uh, everywhere. You have heard a great deal about how he did it in uh, space, and he did it in very uh, many other places as well at the institute, as well as uh, very rare that he had a he had a, an opportunity to do it. Well, I've never really I've not yet said told you all that I could about what I had felt about uh, Dhawan then and later on. And I will close with a few pictures. Um, here is a citation. Here is the camera I had to make. This shows how primitive the equipment was. I won't tell you how this camera works. It's a one dollar camera. There is a Professor Dhawan among all the other great men of the country uh, over the previous hundred years. So, sorry, go ahead. Here he is. Uh, lecturing at uh, the first Indian, uh, for the first Asian Congress of Human Mechanics. Here he is with young men, full of uh, sense of humor. You can see, you can see how he is uh, with a big smile and so does everybody else. That was the sense of humor he had, and that's the way the students actually looked at him too. He was a friend, he was uh, uh, very, can you go back? I'm going to close with this citation which was presented to Professor Dhawan, the place on record. And I think you can see that the staff and students of the Institute of Science combined to show how much they liked him, our deep admiration for his extraordinary achievements as a scientist and administrator, led this institute with great distinction, outstanding contributions to the growth of the institute, to the development of science and technology in the country, Sincere appreciation of the many services he has rendered to this institute and those who work in it. Long and distinguished tenure, first as a member of its faculty and then as a director. And our affectionate regard for his exemplary qualities as a liberal scientist, a devoted teacher, an illustrious executive, a practical visionary, a citizen with deep social concerns, and a human being of great personal charm. Thank you very much. <laughs>